Right, so I've been sick for like the last two weeks and haven't really wanted to read anything new. So this is just going to be a, an emphatic recommendation about a book that I think most people should read. And that is The Ape That Understood the Universe by Steve Stewart Williams. This book is about the much accosted field of evolutionary psychology and mostly about offering a defense and as well as explaining what the field does say and what it doesn't say. The main thought experiment that kind of behinds this, that's behind behind this book, that kind of frames the entire thing, is that you are an alien anthropologist, right? And you notice some radio waves coming from, from the soul system. So you come to investigate, and you find the radio waves came from this weird species of ape called humans. Now, what can you determine about their behavior from from your knowledge of evolutionary principles. And that's the main thought experiment that underhinges all of the, that underhinges like the whole book. Imagine you're an alien looking at human behavior. So Williams tries to draw from a lot of uh, similar examples or antagonistic examples from nature and tries to use that to explain human behavior in certain ways. To my understanding quite well, once we get you know, kind of out of the way, what is evolution, what it does, what does it say, what doesn't it say. If you've read um, The Selfish Gene from Richard Dawkins, this isn't going to be news to you, but uh, long story short, evolution cares about the propagation of your progeny more than any individual. But yeah, that's the um, overall thought experiment. You are an alien, you're looking at how every other, you're looking at how animals evolve, and you're looking at humans as just another animal. That's the thought experiment behind this. Can you draw any inferences from human behavior by looking at the commonly understood evolutionary pressure, from commonly understood evolutionary um, explanations for things? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, one example of this is that uh, signaling theory is a commonly brought up one, and I believe it's becoming more and more prevalent in the, in the zeitgeist with the understanding of the term virtue signaling. But what signaling in evolutionary terms ends up being is, the example given in the book is a gazelle is known to do something called a stot, which is to say that they jump up in the air really high when they see a predator. Why would the gazelle do this? It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. It, it doesn't make the gazelle any quicker. It uh, it doesn't signal anything to the other gazelles around it. Every gazelle that sees a new a new predator will stop. It, on the surface, it looks like a waste of energy, but it's actually not. You see, when a gazelle jumps up in the air like the like this and does what we call stotting, it signals to the predator that one, I see you. You can't sneak up on me, and two, I am a healthy individual that you cannot catch. This gives the predator the opportunity to decide if that signal is honest or dishonest. And if it's dishonest, they're going to chase them and run them down. But if it's honest, it works in the predator, let's say cheetah. I don't know if cheetahs actually chase gazelles, but let's say cheetah benefit to not waste the energy on trying to on a futile chase. And this is like, I think, called adversarial um, signaling. Now, obviously, that has a lot of applicability to human nature. We often say and do things we don't necessarily believe in because we're trying to signal something else about ourselves. When a Chinese person talks about how there is, about how there's nothing bad happening in Tibet or in Inner Mongolia or, or to the Uyghurs or anything like that, it's not necessarily that the Chinese person actually believes that sort of thing. No, they tend to be, what we actually find is that the Chinese people in particular tend to be the most critical of their government and tend to believe it the least. But what that signals is that I'm willing to say this sort of ridiculous thing that nobody actually believes to prove how loyal I am to the government. And that's just one example of how, about how signaling is applicable to human nature. But this is more meant to be an overview of the book, so I'm not going to get into every little detail. Read the book. The next thing that's made fairly explicit is about the differences between intra and intersex sexual selection. But sexual selection is, is actually Darwin's major contributing understanding. Most people think that anyone could have gotten natural selection at 
uh, at, at the point that Darwin came up with it, but it took a genius like Darwin to come up with sexual selection. Sexual selection is just the understanding that the opposite sex tends to have an effect on um, what traits get passed down from generation to generation. And the same sex. Uh, the peacock's tail is the premier example of this. What this does is this signals to the females, like these pig, this big lofty peacock's tail signals to the females that I am so fit that I can waste energy on this um, frivolous display. And you see a lot of that in human behavior too. There's like an entire pickup strategy called peacocking. It obviously has some applicability. That's the more basic kind of sexual selection. But Williams tries to remind us that that's not the only kind of sexual selection. The other kind of sexual selection is, well, you're looking at it. Amongst deer, you'll commonly see the, like the animals with like the really, you'll, you'll commonly see the uh, males with the very elaborate uh, antlers. That's the word I'm looking for, with the very elaborate ant antlers. And, you know, they'll butt their heads for competition, for competition so that they can mate with uh, for competition so they'll mate with among the female that is another kind of sexual selection and it is a sexual selection within the sex they clash against each other with their you know very elaborate antlers and the one that wins in that dominance hierarchy gets to access to the females of the species right makes perfect sense a great example of this amongst human beings is well, like I already said, you're looking at it. Human women have shown no great preference for a beard or against it. It's kind of a, uh, if you have, some some prefer X, uh, some prefer men with a beard, some prefer men without a beard. But what a beard does actually very well is it tends to intimidate other men by hiding a weak jawline, which tends to be a signal of, um, which tends to be a reliable signal of a higher testosterone, which also tends to be a good signal of, um, upper body strength and so beards seemed so seemingly the reason that beards evolved was that they work as a very good signal intrasex sexual selection sort of thing the men that didn't grow beards tended to lose out to men that would because the beard did a good job of intimidating other men into not fucking with your girlfriend which does get into the Yes, in fact, mate guarding behavior is incredibly common in the animal kingdom, and it doesn't seem to be any different in human beings. Which, I feel like the book does a better job explaining that than I can, so again, read the book. But that gets us to the, the largest and most important point when we sort of talk about evolutionary psychology, is that a lot of the times, it'd be really, really weird if a lot of some of human behavior wasn't biologically based. It touches on these subjects that people consider taboo, and how much is nature and how much is nurture is people really, really don't seem to want to want, want to understand that humans have a nature. We People seem incredibly resistant to, to it. We commonly get kind of lackluster explanations that we wouldn't accept if we were saying this about literally any other animal. A good example of this is when you hear about the term toxic masculinity, one of the things that's commonly brought up is that, that men tend to be more aggressive than women. And the social constructivist type people will say that that's due to how our society constructs the masculine and feminine roles. But you see, the thing here is that doesn't make any sense. Because in every animal on the planet, every animal on the planet that we're aware of, the sex that is both larger and tends to invest less in children, less in the children, which certainly fits for male humans, also tends to be the most aggressive. Those three traits basically always show up together. If you got two, you're getting the other one. So we're kind of in this weird situation to where it's like, I suppose it's possible that evolution created a humans to be completely blank slates only for culture to recreate the exact thing that evolution would predict us to be like, but it seems unlikely and it seems unnecessary to make that explanation. So if you get nothing else out of reading this book, it's that a lot of the times... We don't need to justify the biological explanation. The cultural explanation is the one that needs the justification. Men tend to be less neurotic than women. But frankly, it would be weird if that wasn't the case. That would really be the thing that throws a spanner into our understanding of evolution. But the fact that that tends to be... That that's coterminous with human, with human and, you know, every primate. You know, it'd be weird if it wasn't that way. And that's really all I have to say as like a basic understanding of the of the 
the most important points. Obviously, the book goes into these far better and in far more detail than I do here. And I felt like throwing it out there so that other people could um, kind of have a peek behind the curtain of human behavior, as it were. Just give them a few years and they might deserve the name of ape that understood the universe. That's from a channel called Baba Brinkman. You should totally check him out.